Welcome to an exceptional edition of Rebellion Research. I'm here with the super brilliant Vinaren, who's going to help us understand how to analyze financial objects. It's really, it's a, a theme that's so incredibly important to the quant of today. Whether you're an 18-year-old aspiring quant or a portfolio manager, the question of analyzing financial objects is as relevant as it could possibly be. Vin, thank you so much for coming on today. Alex, it's good to be here. So hello, everybody. So I'm Bing Ren, the founder and CEO of SIGTAC. So my company is a technology specialist for financial capital markets. And uh, our products um, only target buy-side front office users, such as traders, portfolio managers, analysts, and uh, researchers. So today, when we talk about um, quant finance, it's really fascinating, because if I were to draw a Venn diagram Right, quant finance requires kind of three different categories of skills. Number one is economics, right? You have to have basic concepts about the market, about the yield curve, fixed income, et cetera, et cetera. And then a second category is essentially math, right? How to price, you know, options, you know, how to do, you know, time series analysis, <clears throat> how to run numbers, essentially. And then the last category of skills required to do quant finance is computer science, it's programming. How to, how to write code. So that's why quant finance is one of the most uh, demanding, but also most one of the most fulfilling career um, in the world today. Um, so when, when we think about the financial market, we think about it kind of in these three different axes, right? So um, um, in terms of objects, what, what I really mean by objects are you know, three, actually also three types, instruments, financial instruments, like how does a future work? How does option work? How does, you know, bond work? You know, how, how each instrument, how the price moves, what are the market for that instrument, you know, functions and, uh, and the like idiosyncratic attributes for each of those instruments. And then the second category would be strategies, you know, trading strategies, investment strategies, uh, whether it's about short-term or long-term and different strategies have different structures. Some is directional, some is relative value, um, some is more timing based, some is more in the market and not to miss out, right? And the last bit is about portfolios because once you have one strategy, you're going to come up with more strategies. So when you construct portfolio, it's about the correlation metrics between those strategies, how they are trying to capture different parts of the market and the more diversified the portfolio is, um, the better the sharp ratio. So, so at SIGTAC, we put a lot of efforts into understanding each of these objects in three different buckets. And then um, we model them and we get the right market data, um, you know, alongside the model so that our users can use them as quickly and as easily as possible. So we are launching APIs access to all these hundreds of objects we created. And the user can just write one line of code, for example, to create a, you know, ball selling strategy on a single stock Delta hedged every day. So something very complex, complex, but can be made, you know, accessible uh, today. So let me just stop here. And uh, yeah, well, my first question is how versatile is the data that you can offer for this platform? Mm -hmm. For instance, if I want to create a trading strategy based on the level three movement of, you know, GM over the last two weeks, is that something you could cater to? That's right. So uh, thanks, Alex. Alex. So we currently um, um, cover all that all the major asset classes. So from equities to fixed income to FX to commodities, um, to uh, and also derivatives, right? Futures and options. So what you described is totally can be done. So what we or well what we have onboarded onto our platform um, includes market data, which I just describe as prices and volume, but also alternative data sets, right? So like the company specific data sets. There are you know, currently maybe 3,000 data sets available in, in the in the alternative space. And, and it covers from everything from retail sectors to, you know, auto sectors. Uh, ben, may I interrupt you and ask you, I, I recently read that uh, Elon Musk is starting to limit Twitter data now as he feels it's being used for investing in other such purposes and, you know, he wants to monetize it. Uh, do, you, do you feel Twitter data is useful? Are you guys covering it? So we currently do not cover Twitter data, but Twitter data has been become uh, quite popular, I would say, in the last um, three years, especially during the uh, COVID pandemic. Because during the COVID pandemic, uh, retail flow 
um, became a major part of the um, equities you know, trading daily volume. Yes. Right. So, uh, so people go to including you know I think we there are there are there are stories about like top tier you know long short equity fund got you know uh, you know uh, hurt in some sense by the retail traders. Um, um, so people were starting to pay a huge amount of attention to the sentiment and the discussions that's happening on Reddit um, and uh, and on Twitter. So I think what yeah. What about uh, company release sentiment? Can a user write a code uh, based on the number of you know positive words in a, a 10Q versus negative words in a 10Q? Are you uh, at a natural language processing data yet? Yeah, I think that's that's one of the um, major things we're going to release later this year, which is to introduce uh, large language models, uh, large language model functionalities to our APIs. Right. I think the large language models these days um, has uh, it's, it's a fascinating topic and um, and um, the surging interests around the world it has been incredible. Um, I think for um, I, I think it's honestly, I think it's going to disrupt how front office users in finance you know do their job. Okay? Yes. for I example, agree. yeah, well, I think one thing is um, the large language models, I think there are two aspects, at least two aspects which is, which are highly disruptive. One is the the ability to bring together both textual information like the earnings report, uh, but also bring together textual information with numeric information, which is numbers. Like I, I can give you one example. Yes. For example, if you are a portfolio manager of a long only fund, and uh, the fund has an investment mandate, right? Each you are, you are the fund manager, that's an investment mandate, which is a document. It says very clearly. Uh, you know what you can you can buy, what you can sell, which markets, what instruments, and uh, also risk limits, and then it it will also describe what you call the investment process, right? How you analyze the company, what's your philosophy? Are you growth driven or are you value driven? That this humongous document written in details, which is like your mandate to manage your investors' money, right? You must give you the money based on this document which they have agreed to, and then. What we can do today is use a large language models that reads this document so effectively understands your fund, your mandate, your process, and then turn around, look at the portfolio positions you have got, and then questions you <laughs> like, oh, Alex, why do you have this position? Can you justify? You can literally have a conversation with these large language models in a, in a conversational bot which has trained on your investment process, investment mandate, and your portfolios, and the historical performances, and the risks. And you can have a, almost like having a AI-powered intellectual sparring partner to make to help you make a better decision. I think it's happening very no, fast. No, brilliantly said, and, and backed up by Societe Generale, who released uh, research that I had the pleasure of reading, showing that after a company quarterly release, there was 90 to 120 to as much as 180 days of market failure to react to that information. The market would react, but the market is still incredibly slow. And it includes $10 billion, $20 billion companies where, you know, if the quarterly release isn't great, how many analysts are going to really plug it into the numbers and really get onto it? And if you're a portfolio manager and you have 200, 300 stocks, how can you dive into one, you know, 60 bit position? When you've got you know Tesla reporting later that day, I mean I think of my my own very close friends who run these gigantic mutual funds, and it's so hard for them to keep track of their smaller positions. And you know at the same time, you have ten mutual funds that eliminate a forty bit position. That's going to be a gigantic movement on the market. So, uh, you know, I think your lang uh, large language model that you're going to release later this year is is going to be super super exciting. Uh, that's uh, I think you're going to have, you know, find just, uh, you know, like when McDonald's released uh, their hamburgers, there were lines around the block for the McDonald's brothers. Uh, you know, the desire to have, you know, right now, ChatGPT is pretty stupid when it comes to financial analysis. I've tried, I've tried with my students, my students have tried. It's really very basic stuff. They can tell you like when the bank was founded, who founded it, you know, they can tell you the number of franchises it has, but 
it's it's really not adept at taking quarter to quarter revenue growth and saying, okay, hey, this company's always had a high PE ratio, but it's also had high, you know, revenue growth. All of a sudden the revenue growth is slowed, but the PE ratio is still high. Portfolio manager, is this still a relevant investment for you? Alex, you touch on some really exciting, uh, really insightful oh. um, points. For example, as a portfolio manager, um, you have a very small position in one company. I have a very big position in Tesla. But as far as the amount of work is required, right? To read the document, to do some numbers, to come to a conclusion, the cost is more or less the same, you know, for each company, no matter how big or small and how big or small your position, position is, right? It, 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 it actually, perversely, I would say the work is probably more there's more work required for smaller company because there is they are less covered, there's yeah. less information, and less liquid, right? So this inverse relationship. Your, your your base knowledge ratio is just lower, so you've got to catch up just to to start you know doing your analysis. So yes. I would agree it's it, it, it'll take more time and it's 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 painful. It's painful, and so therefore we have, so the portfolio manager these days are in this in an awkward position, uh, whereas they can't afford to put a lot of resources analyzing small positions. But when they add up, they do make a difference. But on the other hand, there's more and more information coming out through different channels, whether it's public domain or from the corporate or from the social media or from alternative data. So the pressure on our target users, the front office users is immense and it's increasing every day. They are under constant pressure to the way we describe it is to minimize the delay from ideation to execution. How long does it take you to have an idea and then take it to the market to execute and make a difference, right? You mentioned when an earnings report comes out, it can take several months, maybe a couple of quarters for the for the price to reflect it, reflect, reflect it. So we hope that with the uh, models and data for the financial objects and uh, with large language models sitting in the middle, almost like a, like a, like a, a coordinator in the large language model, understand concepts, understand text, and but then be able to run models and data to come so, to the So the idea being that portfolio manager XYZ can look at an option that maybe he or she inherited from another manager who left that firm and say, I don't even understand this option. SigTech, what are, you know, what are the odds this option has? How much risk does this have? You know, wh wh what do you expect? Uh, you know, you know, basic information that the manager might have to spend hours on that you can, you know, kind of ha offer kind of information catch up, if you will. That's right. I think I think just like Microsoft released um, so-called GitHub Copilot for programmers. So apparently, uh, once a developer starts using Copilot, uh, which is AI generating code uh, for the developer they write about five times faster because a lot of the boilerplate code yeah. you, written by a developer now can just be automated, right? You write the, the comments say, what does this function do? And the AI writes the code. So you can focus on the one that's really required your attention. My friend wrote Copilot uh, and for all of his work, he got a like a $20,000 uh, bonus. He posted this on Twitter. He was upset about it. <laughs> uh, Basically, Copilot was, you know, predominantly written by a friend of mine who, yeah, for all of that work, you know, it's amazing when you own the capital, you can become endlessly rich. But when you work for another, uh, it's just an annual bonus. But yes, Copilot was written by my friend and, uh, you know, he received, he was you know, still upset about it. But nevertheless, uh, this was a really fantastic show, uh, Ben. I, I, I have to ask. Can, you know, as you know, I teach, can students access your information? I, I know, you know, obviously banks and funds are your primary tar target, but what about, you know, all of my MFE students? Are, are, do yeah. you have many university uh, partnerships or programs? We actually work with uh, 20 um, top universities around the world, and we are actually building a, a quant finance certificate program with Imperial College London. And uh, we are also opening up uh, our API services to everybody in the world. So we have a, a beta access uh, wait list. Um, well, we can put the link in the description and uh, we welcome people to join our community and we'll be launching in a, in, a, in a few weeks. I have to point out Imperial College London has really become a 
fantastic school. It's one of the schools that has really accelerated its reputation in the last two decades. It's no Cambridge or Oxford yet. It's not there, but it's really starting to compete with, uh, you know, an LSE and, uh, you know, UCL. Um, you know, London has, uh, the UK has such fantastic educational institutions. You guys really are very lucky for that. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, um, these days, if you, um, you, you, uh, you apply for a major in engineering or computer science or math, um, I would say, I was, I think most people would say Imperial College, College London would be second next to Cambridge. So if you, you know, somehow don't like Cambridge or, oh. you know, haven't got into Cambridge. How do you not like Cambridge. Cambridge? I think that's impossible. I <laughs> love Cambridge. In my, in my next life, I want to be a professor at Cambridge. I was at the MIT graduation three weeks ago, and I actually sat next to an Imperial College of London uh, post grad who was going to go be an economics professor at Yale, and we had a lovely conversation. And uh, we talked all about Imperial College and how they had just had a significant focus on STEM that came about in the late '90s, and it's really paid off. And Imperial mm. College is, you know, it's 100% an Ivy League level uh, school. Uh, mm. I, you know, I think many students would choose Imperial College over a number of the Ivy Leagues, quite frankly. Uh, ben, this was a fantastic show, and uh, you know, I really appreciate you donating your time today. Thank yeah. you, Alex. I, I want all of our viewers to go to SIGTECH, please, and uh, check out their instrument for analyzing financial objects, uh, whether a fund manager or a grad student. Uh, I also encourage you to follow Ben on LinkedIn. Uh, he's got fantastic insight into the world. Ben, Thank you, Alex. Bye. Bye. Pleasure.